Good afternoon, LEC community. Welcome to another edition of LEC Live. My name is Edgar Palacios. I am the founder of the Latinx Education Collaborative, and we work on increasing the representation of Latinx education professionals in K-12. Every time I do this, it feels like it's been a while since I've done this, so I apologize. I get a little bit uh, anxious. I have a lot of energy that comes along with it. So uh, anyways, just know that I'm excited about being here with you all today, community, um, on this fantastic and I think maybe kind of cool Tuesday afternoon. I don't know. I haven't been outside in a while. Um, anyways, I'd love to welcome our guest today, Carla Perez Olorzano. Carla, how are you doing? Good. How are you, Edgar? You know, I'm excited to get to talk to you a little bit today. Um, you and I, I say we go way back, although it's probably been like a, maybe a year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that, is that about right? Yeah. Um, I got to tell you, we, you know what, before I, I always do this, before I go into this, <laughs> for those of us that don't know you, Carla, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, thank you for having me, Edgar. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, a little bit about me. So I am Nicaraguense. I think we share that in common. So <laughs> that's exciting. Uh, if you couldn't hear me, I'm just clapping and excited <laughs> about this. Uh, this is a historic moment for the LEC. I don't think we've had another Nicaragua Wednesday yet, um, but just just glad to be in community with, with my people. Yeah, definitely. So um, I was born and raised in New York City. Uh, both of my parents immigrated in the 1970s into New York City, and uh, we, we were raised there. I am um, first generation. and. Um, I was raised in a New York City lifestyle. Um, I've been here in Kansas City for about two years now. And um, yeah. So directly from New York City um, mm -hmm. into Kansas City. Yes. What was the transition like? I think the transition was pretty smooth. That was That was my intention, you know. <laughs> And uh, we 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 look to to make that you know a, a part of it. Yeah, yeah. For well, sure. so let me ask you a question. I've only been in New York City once. Um, mm -hmm. It was probably it's like two a half two and a half years ago, and I felt crowded. Um, I felt <laughs> um, energized. Felt a lot, just a lot of things that are, we're not used to in Kansas City. I think um, I'm originally from Miami. Um, and so I thought that I would be used to a city like New York City. I was dead wrong. Um, so I can't imagine. Do you find that life is a little bit more tranquil here in the Midwest? Definitely. It's a, a culture shock. You know, it's it's different. Um, you know, being being from New York City. It's definitely a faster pace, uh, a faster lifestyle. Um, especially around, I would say the medical field, you know, uh, high, high, high traffic, you know, just in a sense, everyone's always at a higher, um, at a higher, I would say all around stressors, you know, yeah. because that's just the lifestyle there a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up stress right at the beginning of the conversation, something that you and I have been talking about, particularly during COVID-19 um, and even even recent before that was really around the mental health and, and the mental health needs of educators across our community. Um, and so I've been talking to you about some ideas. I'm a little bit some of some of that which we'll mention here um, towards the end of the conversation of some plans that we have for our community of educators and how to best support their mental health needs and and kind of de-stressing um, and and the like. Let me ask you about so tell me a little bit more about your experience um, in, in the space. Um, I know we've talked about hypnosis in the past as well, so I'd love to kind of dig into a little bit deeper into that. Um, but tell me about what got you into the medical field and and, and how did you get involved? Okay, so I, I think I made that choice very young. Um, I remember watching uh, Rescue 911 on television, and, and I had a passion for it. And then just on a personal level, it, you know, um, 
for the first time I experienced being in a hospital, you know, um, I, my family actually was uh, involved in a car accident and I, and I was fairly young. I think I was around five years old. And I remember being like, ah, I want to, I want to be like that, you know, and I wanted to make a difference at a very young age. So that's pretty much how I started getting into the medical field. And right after high school, I became an EMT and I was, uh, an EMT in the five boroughs. So it was, um, I would say, fast paced, again, um, stressful. And um, I ended up getting into hypnotherapy work because I, um, I remember dropping off patients that had cancer and had COPD and I would go and light up a cigarette and that was my way of coping right i just needed a moment i was like i just need to go relax and i would smoke a cigarette and uh i ended up getting into hypnotherapy work through there because at one point in my life i was like yeah i just want to stop smoking cigarettes if i see a patient that is experiencing what they're experiencing i think that i need to do something a little different so um hypnotherapy became part of my life at I would say I was around 24 years old. And when I was able to see how I could live life in a different way, and um, I, I kind of became hooked, to be honest. No, I think, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the fact that like, you know, I, I think about all the ways of like de-stressing and, and coping, right? Mm -hmm. and, and um, obviously an EMT lifestyle is incredibly stressful. I can only imagine the things that you saw or were witness to um, throughout your daily um, interactions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about all the trauma that you've witnessed as well. Um, what do you, you know, at the beginning of your journey into this space, like what were some of those maybe warning signs or feelings that you were associating with that you didn't want to deal with anymore um, that led you into, into finding alternate solutions for, to take care of yourself? Um, great question. <laughs> so I, I, I think I experience like, like you say, both, um, personal trauma as well as, um, just as a medical professional witnessing trauma. I, I, I noticed that I had a hard time sleeping. Sometimes I was a little more anxious or a little bit more reactive. And, uh, I knew that I needed to do something a little different. And through my journey in hypnotherapy, I found some really great mentors that in a sense, um, I feel like they helped me, you know? Um, I remember thinking like, um, I've he I heard this quote and it was, if you give a guy a fish one day, right? You, you kind of feed him, right? But when you give, uh, when you teach someone how to fish and teach them how to be a fisherman, in a sense, they you you feed them for a lifetime. And um, for me, growing up, I didn't really, in a sense, know how to deal or how to cope. You know, coming from a Latino a background, it's like, well, how do we deal with our feelings? You know. Um, how, do we even talk about feelings? Like, what are those things? You know, how do how do we express ourselves, right? Yeah. So, um, I found that through, I would say, um, a more natural approach to being being more mindful and incorporating just different techniques allowed me to be more functional, in a sense, right? To be more present, and something as simple as breathing, right? So I didn't really need a cigarette to breathe. I just had to be more self-aware of what my daily triggers were, if I, you know, and how can I breathe? How can I go through the world a little differently, right? Um, yeah. You know, I often think about um, one, I love that you talked about the cultural component of self-care and in terms of being from a Latino community, do we even talk about emotions? Do we talk about feelings? Is that something that's um, 
culturally relevant and or with us as a community. Um, I think about that. That really made me think about my parents and my relationship with them and growing up and, you know, how I expressed emotion versus how they expected me to express emotion. Um, and to this day, like, uh, I, I have deeper conversations with my parents. I'm less afraid of them. Um, although mm -hmm. my mom will, um, she will find the, her version of the chunkle and come after me if I ever say something that she deems disrespectful. And yeah. so, um, talk to me a little bit about being a Latina and, and, and maybe initially like how you were handling coping, um, that was maybe more culturally appropriate, but not necessarily as helpful as it could be. Yeah. Um, well, my mom used to smoke cigarettes. She no longer smokes cigarettes. And thinking of aunts and uncles and even my dad, you know, they had a couple of drinks. It was like, oh, you know, I had a busy day. I'm going to have a, I have a beer, you know, or they just had different ways of coping. Or sometimes it was like, hey, I'm going to um, just, I guess, distract myself and, and just be busy in a sense. So that's a little bit of what I experienced, you know, it was just kind of numbing it out. I, I hear you on that one. I just, um, <laughs> whew, um, at that, I'm just saying, Florida Caña uh, was, <laughs> oh, wow. was, was, yes. was around. It wasn't like abuse, I don't think, but it, it, was, it definitely was around. Um, and then I also recall my mom as I was growing up, she was working on, once she had a full-time job, she was working on her PhD in immigrant. And so like a lot of stressors in her life at that, that time, um, not to mention she had me as a child early on. And so whew, that's a lot for her to handle. Um, and thinking about my dad working three jobs at a time as well to help support the family and to do that kind of work. Um, stress is, is very common in, in not just our community and all communities, um, but um, you also mentioned just very simple techniques. If I had a bottle of Coke Zero right now, I would show it to you because that is one of my ways of coping with stress and coping with like all the additional pressures that come along during this time. Um, mm -hmm. I know better. You know, I know better than to pick up a bottle or, or a can of Coke Zero. Um, I think it's a better option than what I used to do, which was Coca-Cola. And so I'm hoping that that's the case. I'm not sure yet. Um, but I've recently gotten drinking tea and drinking just water and, and decaffeinated tea and just enjoying mm -hmm. that again um, because it just makes me feel 10 times better than a Coke Zero would ever do, if, if that makes sense. And so you talked about breathing. Talk to me a little bit more about like those simple things that we can do to control mm -hmm. our stress and to manage our stress on a daily basis. So um, definitely just, I would say, breathing. Uh, I'm very, very big on that one. Um, and currently right now, uh, sometimes like on, um, just went back to recently at work, I had, uh, I, I was, a, a trauma tech that day. And, um, we had honestly a patient that it was like back to back um, calls like from one patient in cardiac arrest to another patient in a stroke to a trauma to another trauma. And then we finish off with the trauma one. And in between each and every single call, what I found myself doing was just um, literally breathing. It was like, okay, I'm going to have to breathe this out because I want it to be more effective for the next call. Right. And it was um, having that mindfulness in a sense, just having that self-awareness of, okay, you know, um, here I am and this is what, what I'm doing, right? In this particular call and, and now we just kind of finished up and what do I need to do, right? In a sense, it's almost like I, I gotta fill up this cup, right? And I need to fill it up for myself and so I could be more effective for someone else. Just quickly from our community, Delia, thanks so much for joining us. Self-care during this pandemic with the amount of Zoom sessions and constant stressors and changes throughout the day. I take five minutes to transition out of the office into the hallways of my home, five minutes to breathe or be still and quiet my mind. Thanks to Carla. Um, <laughs> Carla, seems like you have a fan out there um, named Delia. So just FYI, um, 
community you. also just would love to ask you all how are you handling stress during this time how are you de-stressing are you even capable of de-stressing during these times um let us know in the comments share with us uh feel free to engage with us in that way as well um breathing just seems so simple mm -hmm. and sometimes i think the simple things in life could be people people are like oh that's so simple but to actually start incorporating it and be a little bit more self-aware of like, you know, I'm just going to take a moment here for myself, right? Just kind of be present for myself because, you know, we, we do have to go through the world, right? We have work, we have um, home life, we have COVID-19, right? That hit us pr pretty hard nationwide, right? So we have um, just a lot of different things going on and just taking that moment to kind of centering ourselves through, through everything else that's going on and being in tune with ourselves and actually being able to silence our mind for that moment. And, um, we're actually with just these simple breathing techniques, we're going to be able to deliver more oxygenated blood to our body. And uh, we're actually decreasing uh, altogether. We're decreasing, uh, I would say, diseases just by, I would say, simply breathing. Uh, it's such a, it's, it, you know, it's funny because it's one of those um, involuntary actions that we do every second of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so to take a second to actually focus in on something that should be natural to us, right? To take that time. Um, it's such a powerful way to kind of affirm who we are and affirm um, that it's okay to take a breath and it's okay to take a break um, mm -hmm. and, and take care of yourself. And so um, I'm going to shift. I'm going to do a hard pivot here because I am really interested um, mm -hmm. in hypnotherapy. So for those of us that aren't as familiar with hypnotherapy, um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is just me, and hopefully it's not offensive. Like I think about a guy like getting hypnotized into like acting like a chicken. And so I'm sure it's not that. <laughs> So if you can kind of talk a little bit about what hypnotherapy is um, first and foremost, and then I'll ask you some follow-up questions around that. Okay, so um, yeah, you do have stage hypnosis that you have a hypnotist that comes and hypnotizes and you're entertained. Um, you, it's a form of entertainment to a certain degree. Then you have hypnotherapy, which is a more natural approach. It's, um, I would say it could be a one-to-one -one or you could have, um maybe a group setting and and it's the way i describe it it's kind of like you know how you have an iceberg right at the tip of the iceberg the the very top part is our conscious mind right and the bottom is our subconscious mind that's where where we have long-term memory patterns that that are down there and as a hypnotherapist you're you're helping someone in a sense, um, if, if someone comes in and they're, let's say they smoke cigarettes, right? You're able to, in a sense, almost teach them that they could do something a little different. Something as simple as breathing, of course, or just something different. Maggie, if you engage people in hypnotherapy, um, what are some of the surprises that you've seen? What are some of the success stories that you've seen um, from that perspective? So some of the great, um, I would say, stories that, that I'll share with you is um, people stop smoking cigarettes. Some people stop having anxiety. And of course, these are actual hypnotherapy sessions, right, that I'm speaking about. You know, you have a one-on-one -on -one with someone and maybe you could work on a, with a client for about two hours, three hours. And... Um, and we have great success stories around that, like eliminating anxiety. Um, some, I would say, even some depression. You know, um, being able to focus better, perform better, right? So it's it's something that that's all natural in a sense. You're just relaxing the body and relaxing the mind. Some of us need uh, that help and that support in order to learn how to relax. Um, mm -hmm. You recently also did some sessions with educators as well, or you've done sessions in the past with educators. What are so what are some of the common themes that you notice among amongst educators around their stress levels, and how do you think 
um, what do you think some of the needs are that we can start help addressing some of these issues within our community of educators as well? Mm -hmm. So I did, I did, I have worked with, um, and, and I have done some, some events with, with, um, I would say educators. And, um, I, I think that one of the common themes is just them being overloaded on what they have to do, you know, um, just the high demands as that educators have, right. You know, they're, they go into to a school setting and, um, you know, they have a lot of students that they have to, in a sense, be present for. So, um, and, and they just have a lot to do. So I think that was a common theme that I saw that it, they, they were just very busy, um, had high demands, um, didn't really know how to kind of like, in a sense, almost what to do for themselves a little bit. Or, to, to kind of de-stress. You know, I just, I think about our community and I think about the people doing the work today and everything that they're navigating, uh, particularly with COVID. Uh, some of us don't know whether we're going back to school virtually or uh, in person yet. Um, mm -hmm. That's still out there. Um, the stress level of, our, you know, do we have the resources that, are, 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 that we need in order to be successful? Um, and so you're absolutely right. And then the time it feels like time is fleeting and there isn't a lot of time to do other things because a lot of educators are also parents or committed family members or involved in the community in other ways. And so what are your recommendations for folks when time becomes an excuse as to why they don't take care of themselves or, or proactively work on things that might make them feel better throughout the day? I think it's important for us to reevaluate what our priorities are, you know, and think a little bit about like long-term, right? Um, and I think it's important to, to be present for ourselves and in a sense, again, care for ourselves and fill up our cups in order so we could be more effective for someone else. Cause you think of long-term, it's almost like putting a bandaid on something. And if something's kind of surfacing for us, whether it's like, Hey, I I'm feeling it in my body. Cause I'm just kind of overloaded. I'm just stressed because of work or because of just my day. What? Um, how, how is my body responding to that? So. So you and I have spoken uh, a couple of times mm -hmm. um, and I had this idea. So part of one, one of our strategic objectives with the LEC um, is, is around the retention of Latinx educators um, in mm -hmm. the profession. And so Susana and I talk a lot to educators who feel isolated in their, in their classrooms um, yeah. who, um, depending on, you know, if they're bilingual or not, or, or, or whatever, you know, like they might feel like they're the chief translator of the school or the community or the district that they're in. Um, the additional pressures that happen when you are a uh, Latinx in a building, right? And so the additional conversations and the additional attention to equity that sometimes happens. And so there's a lot of things that are piling on. Um, and so something that I thought a lot about from, I guess, the very beginning of the organization and the founding of the organization is really how do we better support our educators um, and making sure that they understand that self-care is a priority, um, understanding that they need to take care of themselves in order for them to show up and be fully present for their students. Um, and hopefully in with the idea that also if they're taking care of themselves, that they stick around longer in the profession, right? That they're able to navigate and weather some of the storms that come along with being an educator in today's environment. And so you and I have been talking about how do we help, how do we potentially partner and, and bring in some activities to help support our, our community of educators in this space. And so I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about some of our plans. Um, first and foremost, with like the Wednesday wellness tips that we're gonna start debuting here in the next day or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna be doing the, I would say wellness Wednesdays, right? And uh, we're gonna have some great tips for our educators. Um, we're also, we're, we've been talking a little bit about some healing circles, right? And creating a safe place that we could kind of come together and start healing. And I think start healing on all levels, right? Because each and every single one of us has a different story, a different background. We're going through, through home life, work life, and, and just creating a safe place for them to come. Um, we could be doing um, a little bit of guided imagery um right 
progressive relaxation and um, some breathing techniques to help empower us that when, when we go back into our work life, our home life, we're gonna be a little more effective. Talk to me a little bit about what guided imagery is. So guided imagery is um, a great way to access, I would say, your imagination, you know, just kind of closing your eyes for a moment and envisioning yourself, right, guidedly. Um, close your eyes for a moment. Imagine, you know, walking down, you know, uh, walking down uh, a beautiful pathway, you know, what, what does that look like for you in a sense, like, right? Or imagine being at the beach. So it's, it's a guided, it's a guided um, relaxation, right? And what do you mean by progressive relaxation? So with progressive relaxation, um, you know, the first time I experienced progressive relaxation, I was uh, the client, right? And I remember I was uh, in in a session and uh, it was just, I was like, I can't relax. You know, I felt like pretty much stiff. And um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a way to relax your, your body, you know? Um, it's, it's fairly simple. So um, ideally, the platform we're gonna be using is what we're using right now, right? We're gonna be doing a Zoom or, um, and uh, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have people engaged in our, in, our, in our workshop and they're gonna be sitting comfortably in a chair and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna ask them to participate by using their imagination. And as they're participating, um, I'm gonna go down in a sense, I'm gonna have them focus on their breathing. And as they focus on their breathing, I'm going to spread that relaxation. It's like, okay, well, now notice how your body feels sitting in that chair. And as you notice your body feeling uh, sitting in that chair, you know, just start letting go of all the cares and concerns. So I'm going to allow them to be present for themselves and then just kind of spread once they're present for themselves, start spreading that relaxation throughout their body. And sometimes people don't really know in a sense how to do that. So uh, that's a little bit about progressive relaxation. It's um, having them be engaged in their body and allowing them to start releasing the tension in their body. That is, I mean, it's, uh, I think about um, so many, like, I, I think about being a client my first time that I went through like a breathing exercise and it's not, I thought it was a little, um, what's the word? Um, I couldn't get into it. You know, like I, there was so much there that I couldn't get into and, and couldn't really access relaxation. I was like closing my eyes and then kind of laughing inside of my brain a little bit, just because I'm like, this is the, the weirdest and most ridiculous thing I've ever experienced or so I thought, or I felt at the time, you know, cause I was, I wasn't really open to the, mm -hmm kind of ideas and then the more that i've engaged folks like yourself and the more that i've engaged um those practices um and understood the the ideas and 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 the, and the motivations behind them like the more that i'm like it is so important that we take time for ourselves on a daily basis to really sit in, in a meditative space to understand like where we're carrying tension to understand like how our body to listen to our body essentially um so we can address any of those needs or issues along the way and I think about teachers, I'm hoping that some of the lessons that they'll take and some of the some takeaways that they'll have from engaging with um, our sessions um, will be that they can take these practices and take them into the classroom or into their living room, depending where the classroom is these days, uh, mm -hmm. and, and really guide themselves, particularly when they're super stressed or they're you know, frustrated with technology or whatever that is, that they can have five minutes to take and understand a, a, what a, a guided rela relaxation process is and, under, you know, hopefully improve their practice and just improve their overall well-being. Yeah, absolutely. And this is definitely um, a lifestyle thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle um, to be able to um, be mindful in a sense and, and, and notice how, how we're kind of going through the world. Right. 
And I definitely, uh, you know, what I envision for LEC is, um, is us again creating a, a a safe place that we can we could we could be that I could be right us together we could be um, I would say a form of healing for our educators. You know, I, I envision um, them being able to to walk out of let's say the sessions um, just being a little more enlightened, having that that self-awareness of, oh, wow, you know, just by me uh, breathing and, and experiencing this simple relaxation, I, I actually feel lighter, you know, I, I feel, I just feel better, you know, and, and, and I definitely see that, you know. Do you think that these are exercises that educators as well can take into their own classrooms and practice with their students? Yes, 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 definitely. I think that, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, this type of work, I would say, is transformational. You know, it, it's definitely transformational. And, and I, I definitely live by it, you know, for, uh, from a personal level to, to now being a facilitator. You know, this is, in a sense, was was my my holy grail like i found i feel like i almost found the light in a sense and um i was able to go through my life differently you know and um and i'm pretty excited to be able to share it well we're excited i think you and i um, will be um, talking a little bit more about what the schedule looks like we'll definitely start this month I'm having some sessions and welcoming people to and join us and inviting folks to join us as well um, and making sure that people are aware that these services are available through the LEC as part of um, our organization, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, of course, the intent is one to allow our educators to find themselves and, and recenter themselves throughout the day um, so they can release some of that tension and some of that stress. Two, the idea is that if we practice this on a daily basis and we practice this um, consistently, that you know we're we're more prepared to deal with the with the work environments that we're in for a longer period of time and so it helps with the retention strategy behind the work that we're doing um and then three you know it's again it's important to take some time to recognize that the systems that we're navigating um, sometimes haven't been designed with us in mind and so the ability to separate to hold space for yourself um and to and to be fully present in that space um is so important and it, it's Regardless of where you go in life, it is such a powerful tool. Um, for, you're right, enlightenment is, is, is a good term for it. Um, Self-actualization, being able to just be present with yourself uh, can help and can help overcome a lot of challenges that come to you in life. And so I'm excited that we're going to be doing this and I'm excited that we're testing it out. I'm seeing how the community reacts to it, seeing if it's beneficial. Um, and so mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us on that. I'm going to pivot because now I just want to talk about Nicaragua. Yeah, uh, I never, <laughs> I never get to talk about Nicaragua. For those of you that um, don't know about Nicaragua, Nicaragua is a country uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of Central America, right? Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Um, my family is from Matagalpa. Where's your family from? My mother's from Nikinomo. Okay. And uh, my dad is from Managua. Managua, the capital. Did yes. you know that in Nicaragua there are two lakes, right? Mm-hmm. They're freshwater lakes, I think like most lakes are, except for like the Dead Sea. And uh, there's sharks in them. Which one? I th there's sharks in Lake Managua, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe so. Sharks. I don't know. I'm, I get, I always get excited about that because I think it's the only country in the world that has access to freshwater sharks. Um, mm -hmm. I could be wrong. What's your favorite meal from Nicaragua? I would say the typical Nicaraguense breakfast. You know, gallo pinto con queso frito, maduro, and eggs. I'm in love. <laughs> oh, and, um, I will tell you, uh, Laura, my partner in life and in purpose, um, she made gallo pinto the other day. Mm, nice. And it was so close. It was so close. Um, not that I'm going to judge her by the way that she makes it, because, you know, she's, she's Mexicana, and so therefore, like, it's just a different type of food. Um, but beans and rice in that special way, 
um, with the tortillas, like the real tortillas, not these tiny tortillas um, that we see all the time. We're talking about like the thick uh, tortillas of maiz, um, mm -hmm. you know, the carne asada. Oh yeah. Have you found any spots in Kansas City that have this food available? Not like, I would say, not like Nicaragua, not you like know? Nicaragua, right? <laughs> No, not one at all. Biggest, one of my biggest dreams, and this will never happen because I don't, I just don't have the capacity for this, um, to open up a fritanga. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. You know what I'm saying? And to have, and to have like the guy pinto, the los, the all, all the different types of plantains that are available, um, mm -hmm. all the stuff. La, yeah, the tajada fritas and maduros and. Was there was there a strong community community of Nicaraguenses in uh, New York City? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Um, I think that th I could probably count how many Nicaraguenses I encountered throughout my life in New York City. Yeah. Um, they were not many. I would say probably two. <laughs> um, what do you What do you think? And I've never. I don't think I've ever asked anybody uh, who's Nicaraguense this. Like, what do you think? is unique um, to the Nicaraguense culture that we can't find anywhere else. Wow. <laughs> um, wow, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I think. I, you know, cause when I think about Nicaragua, I think that there's so many great things. Yeah that that come with the with that come with with the whole country you know um so i i don't know that's i know putting you on the spot you know i think about it yeah. you know and my for me um my parents were born there um they left um when in their early 20s they were fleeing the sandinista uh, war yeah. that was going on at the time i think no different than maybe how your family came to the to to the states or around that same time period anyways um, and so I think about um, in in Miami, Florida. There's a strong community of Nicaraguenses folks. There's also a strong community of, of, of Nicaraguenses in um, in Houston, I believe. Um, but it's it's such an interesting thing. I think a lot of my life for me has been um, centered around like the Mexican American experience. And so for me, like under, I sometimes understand that culture better than I understand the culture that I come from. Um, and so it's really interesting to me to just kind of meet other Nicaraguenses and see what their life experiences have been like. I think we, I only know six at this point in Kansas City. Um, so if you're, if you are Nicaraguense out there and you're watching us randomly, uh, let us know. <laughs> I'd love to connect with you as well. Um, Celia says, El Resucitado. Oh, yes. I love, oh my God. Yes. That, that right there. Thank you, Delia. Um, I think that for me, I love, have you ever experienced Easter in Nicaragua? I have. Um, it is beautiful. So the first time that I went to Nicaragua, um, my mom did me wrong, yo. <laughs> so we went for two weeks. Um, we went to visit my grandma and, and some of my family members out in Matagalpa. And so, you know, we, we flew into Managua. You take like a two hour uh, truck drive from the airport all the way out to Matagalpa. And then you got, you know, like you see all the crazy things that you see I mean, in Nicaragua along the way. And so I showed up not expecting to do anything crazy. And my mom, uh, like my second day, or my grandma actually the second day hands me the a book of the catechism in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, it says, you're gonna go ahead and get uh, your first communion here while you're here. And so wow. for two weeks, Actually, for a week and a half, I had to memorize all the prayers, all the Catholic prayers in Spanish, which was first and foremost, wow. like crazy. Um, yeah. And then I was terrified. That was my introduction to becoming like a real Catholic, even though we can talk about religion later. Um, <laughs> But it was it's such an interesting like experience to see how religion and that kind of culture like permeates the country. And so I think about it, I think about all the different types of celebrations that happen and occur. Um, and, oh, yeah. you know, I I miss that sometimes because I don't think that we have those celebrations here in the country. Like I think sometimes our our family members forget um, or they just don't have access to celebrating in the way that we would in in 
the motherland, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I hear you. Um, were you born in Nicaragua? No, I was born in New York City. You were born in New York City. Um, how yeah. far do you go, or do you go back? Well, I remember going when I was about five, five years old, and then there was a, a very big gap, and I ended up going when I was about, I think I was 23 when I when I visited Nicaragua and I was like, wow, where am I? You know, it was, it was, it felt like a whole new world. Right. Um, and it was one of the, I would say the most beautiful experiences because we went for Easter and, um, my cousin was La Mayor Dona, Doma, I think, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. And, uh, I was able to experience it. I would say Easter and, and El Resucitado, um, the way the Nicaraguenses did. And I, I, again, till this day, I'm still mesmerized by, by, by the beauty of it. And uh, later on, I ended up baptizing Galeo in Nicaragua around Easter time. <laughs> he didn't have to memorize anything uh, in order to be baptized, is that correct? Because if not, I, I feel his pain and the, and the trauma associated with that. Well, we, it was a, a very long mass. <laughs> Just know that. <laughs> oh, I remember. Oh, man. And then I, like, I got my, I did the communion thing and everything. And then I had to do, like, 50, like, um, Hail Marys in Spanish. And I was like, this is crazy to me. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. so that, that's, that's, that's my connection to that. And, you know, very shortly after that, we stuck around for, for Easter and, and those celebrations as well. Um you, you know, this organization, we talk about the importance of representation, right? And we understand that the Latinx community is is, is incredibly diverse, 32 different countries represented in, in the diaspora, so to speak. Um, you talk, of, you, you know, you, you're Latina in the medical field. You're a Latina EMT. You've had that experience in the past. Like, do you see yourself represented in, in the community, um, in, in those spaces? Or do you find that you maybe are one of the few in, in a lot of those spaces, I I would say I'm um they're they're definitely limited. I'm one of the few, you know, and and I definitely would love to see more. You know, I think that um, what LEC is doing is great because of it. You know, I think that you're you're um, really making a difference. You know, because we we need that, and in the medical field, it's again it's very limited. Um, and I find that representation is big when, when you have a lot of Latino patients that come in and guess what, there's a, a language barrier to a certain degree, you know, and then now they're, they're there to get treated and, and, and be cared for. But again, there's that language barrier. We need a lot of more, I would say Latinos in healthcare. You know, it's it's we are as a community. I think we're the largest um, minority group in in the country, and I think that that happened in 2013. Um, under severely underrepresented in a lot of areas. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, we don't have the mass that that you experience in in New York City. Um, what was it like? And I may be making an assumption here, but I mean, New York City was being surrounded by Latinos all the time, everywhere. Um, what is that experience like um, back then compared to what your experience in Kansas City is like now? Um, I'll tell you this. Growing up, I was uh, in in public and private school systems, and um, there was definitely not a lot of Latinos there at all. I remember crying and and just have feeling displaced because I think there was one Latina uh, staff member. And um, growing up, when I got older and went, went into high school and so forth, um, I did have a Spanish teacher, you know, um, and, and that was nice, you know, it was nice to actually be able to, to relate to someone. And, and then, um, again, growing up within the community, we had, it was very diverse. We had a lot of... Um, I would say Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Mexicans, Cubanos, certain places of New York City, you would find more of 
a certain, um, I would say, a, a certain um, population, you know, like if you go to Jackson Heights, Queens, you know, there's a lot of Mexicans, you know, um, and I actually found out later on in life that I think it was in um, past Harlem going into the Bronx, there was a park called uh, Van Cortland, I believe, and there were some Nicaraguenses there, but they were very, very limited and uh, I would say hard to find, so. Do you find yourself, um, do you find yourself as excited when you meet other Nicaraguenses uh, as you would otherwise, or you know, is it more like, eh? I, I love it, I do, I do. <laughs> 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 I do because again, we're so limited and it's, yeah. it's great to have uh, someone that you could, you could relate to, right? You know, I, I, I love that you shared the fact that, you know, um, you had a Spanish teacher who happened to be uh, Latino, Latina um, in, in the space and what, how you mentioned that it was nice. Um, I think about that for our students as well. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, we're not saying that we don't want, um, we don't want to be associated with white teachers. That's not what we're saying at all. We're not saying that we don't want to be exposed to diverse teachers. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that um, from a demographic population perspective, like the fact that, you know, this 20, one out of every four students in K-12, I'm identifies as Latinx. Um, and the fact that only 8% of educators across the country identifies Latinx, like there's some, a, a, there's just a disparity there that we have wow. to hopefully fix. Um, and so I think about all those experiences of all those young Latinx students that are coming up and the reality today, that they may not see themselves reflected um, in the teaching staff, in the curriculum, um, in the culture, in the celebrations um, that, that occur. And so I think about a world where we can create um, that representation. And that's really our goal. Um, I'm going to just dig a little bit deeper and, and maybe you're not prepared to answer this. But, you know, when you had um, your Spanish teacher and it felt nice, um, I'm going to ask you just to kind of deeply explore that a little bit like what would that would that it actually mean to you did you find yourself more connected in the class did you see yourself differently um having that representation available to you or no i definitely felt a greater level of connection um absolutely and um unfortunately growing up i didn't really have um that type of connection that i longed for um in, and I would say in my K, K through, through eighth, right? Not even to 12, because when I hit ninth grade, that's when I started seeing, um, probably my sophomore year, I started seeing um, a Latino teacher. But again, at a very young age, um, I think it was, it was a very big struggle. It was, I felt very displaced you know, and I mean, coming from a two Latino immigrants, right, that spoke very little English, and I was an ESL student, and uh, it was it was it was rough. It was it was a bumpy education for me, you know, and and I think that um, if I would have had, I would say someone I could relate to and understood me more, and I would be able to communicate more. Um, it would have been a different experience for me. Yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that and, and thinking about it from that perspective. And that's something that um, I think we need to tell the story, right? We need to continue to elevate those stories and saying like, it is important. You know, there is this, um, there is a tangible benefit to it, but there's also the intangible and the ability to be seen or recognized or feel like you belong um, is so important to the, to the overall success of any student. Um, and so I just appreciate you sharing that. And, and um, I'm glad that you and I will be working together. You will be working with the LEC um, on making sure that our community has access to, a, at the very least, some tools um, that they can help relax themselves and de-stress their lives and, and you know, find themselves in, in a more present space. Um, and so I'm just excited for our partnership. I'm looking forward to um, our first Wellness Wednesday tip tomorrow um, and what that looks like. And then 
really being in, in community with you and, and seeing how we can we can best support um, the educators that we that we so love. So Carla, thank you so much for joining us today. Any final words, anything that I didn't cover that you may want to touch base on? Um, no, no, not at all. Thank you for having me. I am excited as well. Um, I think that um, in the long run, we're just gonna, um, this is this is gonna be something great to help in a sense be be a support system for our Latino educators, you know? Wow. So I, I'm excited. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And LAC community, thank you so much again for joining us for another edition of LAC Live. Um, we will see you again on Thursday for Ask an Educator. And I hope you have a great remainder of your day. Have a good one.